Hi, it's Greg Dalton. I'd like to hear your comments on the show, topics we should cover, and guest suggestions. You can reach me at greg at climateone.org. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Climate science often focuses on data rather than lived experiences of impacts. One indigenous scientist wants to change that. In order for us to create more justice and just solutions that are more holistic and will address our past histories, it's important right, to incorporate those lived experiences. We also need to elevate and respect indigenous ways of knowing the land. The river to me is, is one of my mother's And so I have sort of this innate responsibility to protect her. That can mean confronting systems of oppression that have made the climate crisis worse. Climate change isn't just about protecting the natural world, it's also about protecting our culture and and who we are. Indigenous insights on healing land and sky. Up next on Climate One. According to the World Bank, land managed by indigenous peoples is associated with lower rates of deforestation, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and better protection of biodiversity. But in many places, indigenous people have been displaced from their ancestral lands through outright theft, land grabs, violence, and war. The Land Back movement advocates for putting indigenous lands back in indigenous hands to dismantle white supremacy and systems of oppression. But that can be difficult to achieve in practice. Still, across the country, we can find examples of land access, stewardship and ownership being restored to indigenous people and more conversations about involving tribal nations in conservation and climate resilience efforts. For example, the National Park Service recently formalized an agreement giving the Cherokee Nation permission to once again gather plants along the Buffalo River in Arkansas, something they had done for generations until the agency took over the river in the early 70s and made it illegal. And later in the show, we'll look at how a nonprofit worked to transfer land back to a tribe in Northern California. Dr. Jessica Hernandez is a transnational indigenous scholar and scientist and author of Fresh Banana Leaves, Healing Indigenous Landscapes Through Indigenous Science. She spoke with Climate One's Ariana Brocious about different ways of knowing. You describe yourself as an Indigenous scientist. Can you help us understand how you define that and what it means to you? Yeah, so one of the main reasons why I identify as an Indigenous scientist is because when I see how Western science is conducted, especially in the academy, is very similar to how Indigenous science or Indigenous ways of knowing have been formulated, where, you know, we have basically derived our knowledge since time immemorial through observations, through kind of similar methods to the scientific method uses. And oftentimes when I use the word traditional ecological knowledge, especially in Western science settings, most of the time, most scientists kind of focus more on the traditional component. So they continue to speak about indigenous peoples in the past tense. And I think that with indigenous science, it kind of shows how as indigenous peoples, we have adapted to, you know, technology, to modern times, and also continue to adapt, right, especially given that climate change impacts are drastically affecting our environments and our communities. How has the settler colonial mentality and relationship with nature contributed to the climate crisis and environmental degradation that we're experiencing today? One of the ways that I think it has contributed to that is this separation from humans from nature. And I think that oftentimes, even when we look at conservation, which is trying to address those climate change impacts or try to protect animal or plant species, humans are always kind of erased from that equation. So when we have marine protected areas, when we have protected land areas, humans are not allowed to kind of step foot in it because, you know, it's kind of protecting a certain animal or species in a glass box without human interactions. And I think that when we look at that separation, even when we try to heal from climate change impacts, it's something that's ongoing where humans are totally completely ignored from natural solutions that, you know, are trying to protect our our species or our biodiversity in that sense. So for people who don't know, I was hoping you could explain the farming practice of milpas and how that reflects indigenous land practices. 
Yeah, so our milipas have been in our community since time immemorial. They're like an ancient traditions where we plant our corn, our squash, and our beans. So it's kind of very similar to the three sisters systems that many Southwest indigenous communities of the United States kind of practice. So through the milpas, it doesn't require a lot of human labor. However, we still practice traditions and prayers. And we still kind of do like minimal human labor, like, you know, removing some of the invasive species, kind of feeding some of the animals, making sure that, you know, the corn, squash and beans are doing great. And then we also harvest other traditional foods and plants that kind of, you know, have a strong relationship with those plants. Right. So through that, um, we're able to grow our traditional foods and kind of feed our entire communities. And I think that it kind of shows the nuances that you know, Western agricultural practices kind of fail to do, which is, you know, introducing more of those monocultural practices where we have plantations, whether it be just focusing on one crop species versus our milpas kind of have that rich biodiversity where, you know, they also become ecosystems to the animals that we consume, such as grasshoppers, which is our big thing in Oaxaca, and also armadillos and other small animals that we, you know, also consume in our traditional diets as well. Right. So there's a big distinction, big difference between this traditional practice of biodiverse integrated farming and then, you know, this more recent, I suppose, in the, within the last century practice of monocropping these plantations of bananas or coffee. And I was going to ask you how the latter, how these uh, big plantations, including the role of multinational corporations like Monsanto, have contributed to the displacement of indigenous peoples from their homelands in these places. One of the ways is just through land grabs. So like, you know, a lot of our lands were stolen and kind of privatized so that they can, you know, the governments could sell them to these international corporations through land grabs. So, you know, they got thousands of acres of land that, you know, it's now being owned by these private organizations. So one of the things that I address in the book, Fresh Banana Leaves, is even how the civil war that started in Central America was as a result of the oppression that these agricultural corporations were enacting on indigenous peoples where labor was being exploited and you know, they were just becoming more rich, the international agricultural corporations and its owners, while, you know, indigenous peoples were being oppressed and they were being kind of displaced from their lands because their lands were no longer owned by them. They were sold to, you know, international entities. And as a result of that, indigenous communities of Central America, and I'm referring to Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, when I mentioned Central America, they decided to kind of like build a resistance movement to kind of address these oppressions and these disparities however because you know the government kind of used the the fear that it still plays a big role in our society which is communism they were able to get support from the united states canada and other nations kind of silence indigenous peoples and target you know indigenous mayan communities from these countries and as a result of that now the United Nations have, you know, has labeled that a genocide because it it was specifically targeting indigenous peoples who were trying to reclaim some of their rights and land, you know, especially land rights in Central America. Right. There's a lot of parallels, I think, between the Manifest Destiny Western expansion in the U.S. that occurred in, you know, 200 years ago. Um, and the land grabs and the displacement of indigenous people here in the U.S., including things for things such as the national parks. And then this much more recent history, we're talking the 70s and 80s when this was happening, and this very similar kind of processes that were happening not very far from our borders. So as you write about in the book, your father survived this brutal violence of the war in El Salvador. He escaped at age 11, and he credits a banana tree for saving his life from a bomb how has that story influenced your relationship with nature? I didn't really understand how it had influenced me, um, especially at a young age, right? Because I was just like, oh, this is a story my father is telling me. Like, you know, my level when I was young and he would share these stories wasn't as, you know, you know, it didn't allow me to understand it. But as I grew older, I kind of realized that nature protects us as long as we protect nature. And that doesn't necessarily necessarily apply to just our animal species. It also applies to our plant relatives or species and in this case my father 
built a strong relationship with this banana tree because it kind of became his sanctuary where he will climb the banana tree that was in his Gria encampment and kind of escape his harsh realities. So as a child, right, he was seeking that sanctuary to escape what he, he was actually facing in the present time or his real life. And through this banana tree, like he will sing to it, he will pray to it. And during three years into the war, when he was 14, his encampment was located by the, you know, the military. And as a result, they bombarded the entire encampment. So his first instinct was to kind of seek refuge under this banana tree. And he thought, you know, his life was going to end. And instead of like the bomb kind of igniting when it fell on the tree he saw how the leaves kind of wrapped themselves in a way that you know prevented the bomb from igniting and oftentimes you know we tend to question like oh maybe it was a bomb that was malfunctioned or it wasn't generated correctly that you know it wasn't going to explode to begin with but for my father his teaching kind of portrays that you know that the banana tree protected him and saved his life and it kind of you know was the ancestor that kind of allowed us to be alive today even you know the future generations the generations that came after him which is you know my generation my brother's generation and things like that Hmm. that's a powerful story yeah (laughs) how did it feel then to grow up in the united states knowing the u.s helped this salvadorian government in the civil war with these targeted killings and massacres uh, against citizens largely indigenous people I think that it has always fostered like a love and hate relationship with this country, especially the settler government. And um, for my father, ironically, right, the United States and Canada, even though they were responsible, they're the ones that gave a lot of political asylum to refugees that were escaping the war. So it kind of shows how um, they kind of took some accountability, but not necessarily the responsibility that came with that. And um, it kind of was, you know, it was difficult, right? Especially my father knowing that, you know, this was a country that played a major role in the killings of a lot of our relatives, in the killings of a lot of our community members. But I think that ultimately, you know, it was the place where he could find a safe haven because even in Mexico, there's still this xenophobia, right, against Central Americans. But as a result of that, because my parents are the only ones displaced from our relatives, we were, you know, we would go back home a lot. And home was Oaxaca and then Salvador, where my mom is from Oaxaca and my father is from El Salvador. So it was kind of like growing into, you know, three different countries, right, because they're all separated by borders as well. Right. So pivoting back a little bit to your academic training and your work as a scientist, you write that you've had to cite your lived experiences under the guise of Western academia, quote, because oral histories are not as valuable as peer-reviewed journals. So how can that gap between indigenous knowledge and Western science be bridged? Yeah, I think it's important for, you know, especially scientists to understand that lived experiences are also as valid and as important to incorporate, especially in the sciences. Like, for instance, as a climate scientist, when I teach climate science, we often um, focus more on the data points or like the numerical data sets that allow us to graph the impacts of climate change. But yet we're still ignoring those lived experiences, those stories of people who are already facing the impacts of climate change. And I think that in order for us to create more justice and just solutions that are more holistic and will address our past histories, especially as a colonial institution. It's important, right, to incorporate those lived experiences, to incorporate those stories that do not necessarily undergo the Western academic disciplines where, you know, you have to peer review, publish your your findings, or you have to write a book, right, in order for people to understand the nuances that lived experiences and personal storytelling also portrays and is, you know, needed for, um, in order for us to actually mitigate and adapt to climate change in this era. Similarly, you're critical of what you term helicopter research, especially in conservation and and some other fields. So what would a more bottom-up approach look like to you? Yeah, so a more bottom-up approach will mean that scientists or researchers take more time to actually build those relationships with the communities. So oftentimes in science, right, we want to write grants. So we come up with a research project that might not necessarily support or benefit the communities more supporting or benefiting our own careers or our own access to these grants or being awarded these grants that will allow us to do the work. 
helped. And I think that for us to kind of remove ourselves from the helicopter research, we have to start with building community relationships and then allowing the communities to kind of dictate or determine what kind of research projects they would like to see or what research projects will benefit their communities. Help us understand the term eco-colonialism and how it gets in the way of a more intersectional approach to environmental stewardship. Yeah, so I think eco-colonialism, like doing kind of addressing that and dismantling ecolonialism kind of ties back to the land back movement where, you know, we see in ecolonialism, it's certain people who have the power and privilege to determine how we manage and sewer our landscapes. Clearly, that hasn't been very helpful because, you know, we're still... um experiencing a lot of biodiversity loss, a lot of land loss. We're still seeing how climate change is impacting our relationships with the land because it's displacing people. It's, you know, displacing also our animal relatives. And through the dismantling of eco-colonialism, it will allow indigenous peoples to steward and caretake of their land, not necessarily own it, right? Because owning the land is not an indigenous aligned value, but kind of more determining how we steward and caretake for our lands. And I think that, you know, when people ask, like, why should that be the case? You know, it's always important to kind of redirect people to the fact that Indigenous people steward 80% of the world's biodiversity and 50% of the world's biodiversity is located in, you know, in my in my countries, which is, you know, because you're Latin American region. And yet when we look at the violence and how safe it is for indigenous environmental leaders in Latin America, you know, we have the highest rates of um, murders, violence, disappearance of our leaders because, you know, there's all these political entities that do not want us to protect 50% of the world's biodiversity. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about indigenous landscapes. If you missed a previous episode or want to hear more of Climate One's empowering conversations, subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your pods. Coming up, the importance of moving away from romanticized ideas of indigenous people. That stereotype is that of the ecological noble savage, where every indigenous person is portrayed as this pristine, magical creature that's prancing with nature. So I think, you know, it's kind of undoing that stereotype and realizing that not all indigenous peoples have strong relationships with nature. That's up next when Climate One continues. I'm Greg Dalton, and we're talking about healing indigenous landscapes. Let's get back to Erin Abrocious' conversation with Jessica Hernandez, indigenous scholar and scientist. Here in the U.S., the government is supposed to consult with federally recognized tribes on projects that affect them or their lands, but it doesn't always do so or not to a degree that tribes feel is adequate. How does that compare with Mexico's legal relationship with tribes? Yeah, so in Mexico, it's it's a little bit more different because we don't have... um tribal sovereignty. And I think the sovereignty that our communities, our pueblos have kind of fostered has been by themselves, like more independent without the legal paperwork. And in Mexico, what we practice a lot is sustainable self-determination, where we don't necessarily have to go through the political realm to get our rights, to advocate for our rights. So I think that when we look at Mexico, when we look at Central America, our indigenous communities are always constantly fighting because we don't have those legal legalities, right, that protect our land um, rights or our indigenous rights as people. And living in Seattle, I'm witnessing how the Duwamish tribe that's not federally recognized, but Seattle is part of their ancestral lands, how they're advocating for those rights. And it, it kind of parallels a lot to what my communities in Mexico and El Salvador continue to do to this day. How can non-indigenous environmental and conservation groups work in concert with indigenous communities and respect tribal knowledge without romanticizing it? Well, one of the ways is that I can think of is just like undoing the fact that we all think that, you know, indigenous peoples have this romantic relationship with nature because for many of us, right, um, we're in the process of reclaiming our relationships with nature, whether it be because we were displaced or because, you know, many of our people are also being raised in cities that 
nature and human experiences and relationships are different than those of us who are raised in our traditional homelands. And I think that, you know, that stereotype is that of the ecological novel Savage, where every indigenous person is portrayed as this pristine, magical creature that's prancing with nature, that has very this in tune relationship with nature. So I think, you know, it's kind of undoing that stereotype and realizing that not all indigenous peoples have strong relationships with nature. We've talked about having better relationships with tribes, with listening to indigenous people about what their concerns might be before Western scientists, you know, come in and decide what some research project should be. Even with the flaws in the conservation movement, it's still sort of the avenue and space we have to work in addressing a lot of these concerns around biodiversity and environmental resources and problems. So are there ways that you would suggest we go about taking on projects collaboratively that can that can really help us get down the road in addressing these past wrongs. You can like hit the nail right in its head, right? Because when you're talking about like collaboration, because I think that oftentimes as scientists and conservationists, we think that we know what's best for the community. And I think that oftentimes in conservation, right, we look at models as one size fits all, when in reality, that's not the case. And I think that by working with indigenous communities, it will allow us to create more justice um, just solutions that are not necessarily going to harm the indigenous communities the most. And I think that oftentimes indigenous communities are trying to address climate change mitigation efforts and adaptation efforts, but unfortunately, right, they don't have the funding to do so. So I think that it's important, right, for us to leverage our power and positionality, especially as scientists, conservationists, who have the means, right, to maybe apply for a grant to kind of support the communities and also kind of step back, right, if they want to lead it, just allowing them to lead those efforts. And, you know, that's how we can support without necessarily kind of co-opting the movement or kind of taking over as the as the voice for them, right? You mentioned the land back movement. Do you think we need to put more U.S. land under the management of indigenous people? And if so, how should that be done and and what would that maybe accomplish? Yeah, so oftentimes the land back movement, I think that, you know, it's something that maybe we're not going to see in our lifetime because obviously, you know, the people who can return the land to indigenous peoples don't want to do that, especially when we talk about governments. But one of the ways that it can be done is that, you know, it allows the indigenous communities from those lands to start stewarding and caretaking for the lands, right? Because oftentimes, you know, even when we try to practice our ceremonies in certain locations because they're national parks or they're urban parks, we have to get special permits. Um, if we want to harvest, med- you know, medicine or medicinal plants, we, we're not allowed to, right? Because it's, you know, city property, it's government property. So I think that even starting off with, allowing access to lands, especially to indigenous peoples who need it for ceremonial practices to gather their medicines will be one of the ways. And I think that, you know, that would be the first step. But through the land back movement, it will allow indigenous communities who have that since time and memorial history in those lands to steward and caretake for their lands and kind of enact those management practices that they want people to follow The appointment of Deb Haaland as the first Indigenous Secretary of the Interior has been hailed as a major step forward in recognizing the harmful past of land management in the U.S. In your opinion, what's been the impact of having her in that position? One of the impacts is that I'm seeing, especially as someone who does policy work as well, is that the recognition of traditional ecological knowledge or Indigenous knowledges or sciences, as like I like to refer to it. We saw how President Biden passed the presidential memorandum where he was like, oh, we should actually look at traditional ecological knowledge, especially when it comes to managing our lands. And I think that, you know, that's something that we hadn't witnessed before, especially coming from the White House, where they're acknowledging indigenous science and indigenous knowledge as something important and crucial, especially when it comes to managing and storing our landscapes and, you know, our our environments, especially as we continue to face climate change impacts. Jessica Hernandez is a transnational Indigenous scholar and scientist and author of Fresh Banana Leaves. Thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Yeah, thank you for having me, and it was an honor meeting you. Today we're discussing Indigenous ways of knowing and caring for the natural world, especially in light of the climate crisis. Eelgrass seed, or hinois in the Comcock language, may be the newest food movement on the coast of the Gulf of California. 
It's even raised the interest of internationally renowned chefs half a world away. But eelgrass has been part of the indigenous Comcock, also known as Siri, culture for hundreds of years, possibly even longer. And as Sam Shramsky reports, eelgrass may have another unacknowledged value, carbon sequestration. I'm at an annual Comcock Cultural Festival in an oceanside town in Sonora in northern Mexico. This year, the indigenous group is also highlighting genois, or eelgrass seed. It is part of their people's heritage, present in songs and stories from the community's women about its place in navigating the sea. And after an absence of a generation or more, eelgrass seed is being revitalized as a traditional food in this celebration and a related cook-off event. To community leader Erica Barnett, eelgrass is full of meaning. What does eelgrass seed mean to me? It's something very important for this community because it was a very special food for our ancestors. So it's therefore very important to the Comcock people as well. The plant itself provides habitat for all kinds of animals, from sea turtles to snails, and like other seagrasses, can help buffer coastlines from climate impacts. But the climate change mitigating properties of seagrasses are tricky to gauge. Estimates from the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy have suggested these plants may represent up to half of the world's 1.4 billion tons of greenhouse gas mitigation potential in coastal and marine environments. Unlike mangroves or kelp forests or even salt marshes, all of which have also been identified as blue carbon sinks that could stem the tide against catastrophic climate change, seagrasses are often on the move. They grow, photosynthesize, and decompose into sediment on the ocean floor or in an estuary. Uh, the only problem with, uh, with seagrasses... University of California Riverside botany professor Ezekiel Escura says all this makes it difficult to estimate and measure the carbon mitigation potential of eelgrass. Is that they have been so little studied. Uh, they're really understudied. So there's a lot we don't know about seagrasses. Like, we were totally in the blind about mangroves and, 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 and carbon sequestration 20 years ago. Seagrasses have taken longer. And one of the things we need is to start studying them seriously. <laughs> The Comcock have become aware of the blue carbon value of this plant, but questions remain about how to capture market value for eelgrass. In a blue carbon framework, this would typically come in the shape of carbon credits, payments for ecosystem services from as far away as Wall Street or London. Offset markets have gained new attention recently as corporations from Disney to Chevron have started setting ambitious carbon reduction goals. But carbon credits often favor restoration projects that generally start from the point of a degraded ecosystem and later show signs of recovery as a return on investment. In a way, we have to perform triage. That's Todd Lemon, co-founder of a mangrove restoration effort on the other side of the Gulf of California called Mar Vivo. His group is planning on building a model that combines carbon credits as only part of the answer. He is particularly unsparing about how little benefit is derived by good stewards in the current approach to market-based solutions to climate change. The, the real challenge is that the standards are um, written such that you are not supposed to be able to get credit from carbon if the area is not under imminent threat. We've never agreed with that. I think that bar is misplaced. I won't even say it's too high. It's just plain misplaced. You really shouldn't be forced to wait until it's too late or near too late before you can claim that there's an imminent enough threat that if you had not intervened, the, the mangroves wouldn't have been saved and therefore you're allowed to generate carbon credits. <laughs> Comcock people collect the eelgrass seed through wild harvesting rather than actively growing more of the plant. In other words, the sound conservation of eelgrass by the Comcock may not exactly yield income for them. At the festival and a related cooking event featuring chefs from four nations, including the Comcock, it was the brown-green eelgrass seed rather than blue carbon on many people's minds. Chinois is packed full of energy and nutrition, and ethnobotanist and writer Gary Paul Nabhan, one of the coordinators for the events, pointed out that only focusing on carbon sequestration loses sight of all that the plant and the seed fully represent in Comcock or Seri culture. Well, the Seri are among the poorest people in Sonora, and to have something that's speculative or aspirational 10 to 20 years out may not be enough um, 
of an incentive for them to be involved in this. But you know, they, they not only understand that it's directly a food, but it's also a key link in the food chain for the shellfish and fish that is their biggest source of income. While the Comcock have harvested eelgrass for generations, this is far from the only place in the world where it grows, and others are starting to take notice of the plant's potential. Eelgrass has gained steam as a culinary superfood in Spain, where renowned chef Angel León has made it a focus of some of his dishes. He's also drawn awareness to its conservation and blue carbon value. Despite real threats from climate change here in Sonora, like how coastal erosion will displace houses or how certain fisheries will continue to diminish, the pressure to monetize blue carbon still seems very far from people's daily lives. It's about learning and also replicating the eelgrass harvest with future generations. And it is very important and very, very, I don't know how to say it. For me, it is very exciting to do this because we have seen how the elders have come closer to us in this process. For Climate One, I'm Sam Shramsky reporting in Kino Bay, Mexico. When talking about indigenous stewardship, the concept of land back frequently comes up. The idea of restoring or returning land ownership and management to the people who historically inhabited those lands. On at once, Ariana Brocious tells us about one recent example of this in Northern California. Earlier this year, indigenous groups in Mendocino County were granted ownership of 523 acres of Coast Redwood Forest, where many of their ancestors lived for generations. It is both uh, the right thing to do and it is the best way to achieve our conservation goals. That's Sam Hodder, president and CEO of the Save the Redwoods League, a conservation organization that acquired the property and donated it to the Intersinquion Tribal Wilderness Council. This is the second time the League has transferred land in Mendocino County's Lost Coast region to the Intertribal Council for Joint Conservation and Stewardship. The opportunity to restore indigenous guardianship to a land that has been in the territory of the Sinkion people for thousands of years. It really is a, a fulfillment of the objective of, of conservation, uh, to restore land to its ecological condition and to also ad address the cultural restoration that can be achieved through rematriation. Through killings, conflict, and land theft, white settlers forced the original Sinkion people from this region in the mid-1800s, according to the Tribal Council's former executive director. That was followed by decades of destructive commercial logging of old-growth trees and related environmental damage. The Intertribal Sinkion Wilderness Council, composed of 10 tribal nations, formed in 1986 as a cultural land protection organization dedicated to restoring coastal forest and marine ecosystems and advocating for traditional cultural land and water rights. A decade later, it established the intertribal Sinkion Wilderness on nearly 4,000 acres of traditional land acquired from the Trust for Public Land. Council Chairwoman Priscilla Hunter says this latest gift of land from the Redwoods League builds upon the tribe's conservation track record. To be able to add this place that's provided or given to us to just take care of, it, it means a blessing for us. Indian people, a whole blessing that we, we were given this land that, that we can protect and be, you know, leave it alone and let it heal. Hunter says this project also restores access for today's Sinkion people to land inhabited by their ancestors. The land was taken from them and not just taken, but they were killed by it for it, and our children were killed, and our family was killed, and our songs were taken, and dances, so all the above land that was taken from us, we didn't have the joy of having a forest to run into and play 
our people now, right? Because we didn't have it. <laughs> it was gone. We could, you know, you could only have access to even gather the foods or the 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 plants or do our gathering, you know, because it, it's not our it's not our land, so we're trespassers. Imagine that. In both land transfers, the Save the Redwoods League established conservation easements on the property in agreement with the Intertribal Council to protect against logging and development. Sam Hodder says the ecological stewardship goals of both groups are closely aligned, focused around protecting the redwood forests and habitat for native and endangered species, including coho salmon and the northern spotted owl. We have the the same goals of letting nature uh, lead, letting the land lead, and having that guardianship advanced with tribal ownership really tells a much fuller story about what land conservation can do. The council and league plan to apply a blend of indigenous place-based land guardianship principles, conservation science, climate adaptation, and fire resiliency approaches to the area. Hodder says this property, which will once again be known by its Sinkion name, meaning fish run place, adds to the larger matrix of protected critical land in Northern California. Coast redwood old growth sequesters more carbon per acre than any other forest in the world. So uh, the conservation opportunity and the need to accelerate the pace and scale of conservation of the redwood forest is a critical climate investment. Beyond this project, Hodder points to a growing recognition in California and elsewhere of the need for more tribal engagement in conservation and the funding to support it. Chairwoman Priscilla Hunter says the land donation helps heal some of the past and offers a new place for tribes to gather and connect with the land. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's, we would have a place that we can go way out there and have our, have our ceremonies I mean, and you can really feel the spirit because it's way out there, right? And it's up in the mountain. And so it's the mountain spirits, you know? And it's really refreshing to to have that. For Climate One, I'm Ariana Brocious. Today, we're talking about reclaiming indigenous relationships with the land. Coming up, we hear from Julia Bernal, a member of the Sandia Puebla in New Mexico advocating for better water access and management in her community. After a time, I realized that my my role in, in this life was to advocate for water because our views, our cultural views to the river are very significant to like relationships with our mothers. And as a daughter, I just felt very compelled to pursue a lifelong career in uh, water resources. That's up next when Climate One continues. Julia Faye Bernal grew up a member of the Sandia Pueblo Nation between the Sandia Mountains and Middle Rio Grande Valley in New Mexico. I've had the best best life here. I've had a wonderful childhood growing up with a family that farms, a family that tends land, a family that has very strong roots to water and agriculture. Grew up riding horses, playing outside, getting dirty, getting cuts and bruises and scrapes. So it's definitely an upbringing that I really, really cherish. Today, she's director of Pueblo Action Alliance, which advocates for the restoration of indigenous water management practices. That involves what she describes as the decolonization of water policy. She draws a lot of inspiration from her homelands and the long history of her people's connection to the Rio Grande. At a time before colonization, this middle Rio Grande Valley had multiple Tiwa-speaking villages. Now only two remain. And Pueblo people, through time and experience on the land, came to realize that settling along the Rio Grande was a good way for us to sustain life, a good way for us to maintain healthy watersheds, 
come up with irrigation systems and become farmers and settle along the waters. And all of these tribes have a very significant and cultural relationship with the river and the water. And we're, we're all very different in the sense, but we definitely do share that same core value of viewing our water as very sacred. What did the river mean to you personally as you were growing up? I grew up closer towards the river, so I had a lot of access to playing along the acequias and as I got older, venturing a little bit further out to actually go to the main stem of the Rio Grande. And for me, going there was always a really, I guess, comforting experience being in relation with our river mother and maybe not fully understanding the cultural aspects of our river and how it plays in our traditions. But as a young person, I knew that there were there was an innate connection that I felt with our river. And even as I started growing up and experiencing adulthood at times in my life where I felt like I was lost or that I didn't have the right direction in terms of career or school or, you know, whatever measures success, (laughs) I would find myself find myself at the river contemplating, you know, what my next move is going to be. And, you know, after time, I realized that my my role in, in this life was to advocate for, for, for water because our views, our cultural views to the, to the river um, are very significant to like relationships with our mothers. And as a daughter, I just felt very compelled to pursue a lifelong career in um, water resources. Did the river speak back to you? I think that I've always spoken to the river (laughs) and (laughs) maybe it's more been that kind of relationship, but I think that the river to me is, is one of my mothers. And so I have sort of this innate responsibility to to protect her her essence to protect all that she provides for because in our cultures being desert you know cultured people water is very significant in terms of abundance and prosperity and longevity so our water is very central to a lot of our core teachings. So you grew up and went off to college. What did you study and what was your college experience like? Yeah, so I went to the University of Redlands. I honestly was really surprised that I got into a college because I was not a very good student growing up. (laughs) (laughs) So I definitely didn't have much direction. But I will say that my college experience was very hard. It was it was very associated with a different kind of culture shock. I felt like I couldn't fully express who I was because people in Southern California didn't understand like what a Pueblo indigenous person is or was or are. And navigating that academic system was really challenging. But along the way, I did meet some folks that worked with Southern California tribes and made some more connections in that world. And now it's coming full circle because a lot of our studies around water do also affect tribes, not just in New Mexico, but in Arizona and California within the sector of water tribal communities and leadership are going to be very integral for future planning. And uh, after you graduated, uh, what happened next? I was at the river because I didn't know (laughs) I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, That was a really hard time for me. 
it took a lot of really deep thinking, a lot of time sitting by the water and trying to figure out what I was good at, what kind of skill sets I can develop over time. And I had a epiphany or something, a realization one day, and I knew that I wanted to get into water, but I knew I didn't have the environmental or science degree. So Mm -hmm. I literally just started calling people. Julie ended up completing an indigenous water resource technician training program at the University of Arizona. She's currently pursuing master's degrees in water resources policy management and community regional planning. I asked her when she first realized climate disruption manifest through water impacts would be part of her life forever. When you leave home for for a couple years, four, four or five years, that's how long I was gone in California, was over five years. And when I came back, I really noticed a really drastic change in our in our weather patterns. And as I would talk to my dad more and more about his um his irrigation season and um my dad grows alfalfa for lot livestock feed and has been doing this for generate um generations as my great grandparents and you know have have all been in this um in this type of work he would say things to me like I know that I'm not a scientist or anything like that but I know that climate change is happening and this is all by being outside and observing weather patterns and being more in tune with the natural world. I have been noticing even more so in the past four or five years that temperatures are really rising here in the Southwest and our water tables are not the same as they were before. There are some specific stretches of the Rio Grande that are in Sandia that aren't as abundant as they used to be. This is still a a very integral part to local economies and self-sufficiency and and culture. You know, the culture of Pueblo irrigation and also acequia users is under threat by climate change, and we're seeing that more severely as as time moves on. What is a sacrifice zone, and when did you start to understand that you are living in one? A sacrifice zone has been historically deemed as a particular landscape that is locally unwanted land use, or they call them lulus. Um, And these national sacrifice areas or sacrifice zones, a lot of them are energy sacrifice zones, have been cultural landscapes that are resource rich and have been discovered, therefore exploited for their resources. And unfortunately, a lot of these deemed energy sacrifice zones are in proximities of living cultures, frontline indigenous people who experience a lot of the impacts that these these landscapes have undergone for for a really long time. Does that make you feel like your life is not as important as others? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's historically embedded in a lot of policies that are supposed to regulate these types of systems. Therefore, if there aren't any codes or ruling that ensure protections for people of color, then of course you're going to feel like you're expendable and therefore not as significant as other people. Julia Faye Bernal is director of Pueblo Action Alliance. So the personification of a uh, river as a, you know, not a resource, but a mother, how does that personification fit in with the campaign to achieve human rights for the river, such as what's happened with rivers in New Zealand and elsewhere? I think there's even an effort in the United States to rec- recognize a lake with, with uh, the rights of a person. So talk about personification of a natural resource. 
since colonial contact, a lot of these concepts of identity to non-human entities has been attempted to be erased. And this concept of recognizing our waterways as mothers also changes the way that we would use our water resources. So we've stripped its original identity and put water resources into a market-based allocation system that's very complicated, but also acts as we're commodifying this resource because we have to claim benefic- benefit of use or beneficial use, which usually means for production, agricultural production, anything that makes money, to you know, say that more simply. But through our cultures and many cultures across the world, mothers are figures uh, in the family that nurture and care and provide and are the backbone to to families and to clans. And so if we're reclaiming this identity as a person, as a mother, we understand that her, she is providing us abundance and it's up to us in order to manage and equitably divert and deliver water to the living cultures on the landscape. And bringing this back to your personal journey, how important has your lived experience been to the development of your water expertise uh, in this era of climate disruption? The water world is also a very white male dominated field. You don't have people that look like me in a lot of these water talks. And so I want to advocate more for a different type of water expertise in the room. It doesn't have to just be a hydrologist or an engineer or somebody that has that technical background. It can be a person that has ancestral and genetic lineage to the landscape, has oral traditions and oral teachings and stories that also can help create and design mitigation and adaptation strategies for the future. And so we have to bring more diverse voices and more indigenous thinkers and water users into these water conversations in order to really understand how to create a system that have collective and shared values. And just one last question. How has living through climate change affected you on the deepest level? Climate change, personally to me, means that my people's culture and way of life is also at stake because we don't know fully what the effects of climate change are going to be in the long run. And as a as a woman, an indigenous woman from Sandia Pueblo who has grown up here my entire life and has participated in our traditions and ceremonies, I want to ensure that we continue this lifestyle with our original instructions forever. And if we don't do something about our water about our air, our soils, our non-human relatives, we won't have those teachings to pass on. And so climate change isn't just about protecting the natural world. It's also about protecting our culture and, and who we are because we've resisted against so many colonial forces for so, for so long. But this is a more colossal issue that's going to impact everybody. Thank you for sharing your story and insights, Julia. Yes, thank you very much for having me today. On this Climate One, we've been talking about healing indigenous landscapes. The interview with Julia Bernal was recorded last year as part of our episode, Living Through Climate Disruption. 
To hear that show and hundreds of others, visit us at climateone.org and subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your pods. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. Talking about climate can be hard, awkward, sometimes difficult and depressing. And it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. The scale is mind-blowing. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Our team also includes Steve Fox and Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young and arranged by Matt Wilcox. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.